Okay, we'll get started. So the dumpster is on fire, again. I love this meme, and I think a lot of us know that at some point we're gonna mess up, but it's probably not gonna be like really big, right? It'll be like a tiny incident, not a huge outage. <laughs> Major outages are for other people, big institutions. We code better, right? Don't we? Who's been the source of an incident or outage? Okay, a few honest people. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, failure is inevitable. You cannot avoid it, but you can prepare for it. This is especially important for your customers because the impact can be much bigger than you think. I am thrilled to be here with you all at, in the SRE track, wrapping up the day. Thank you so much for coming to the last se session and for having us here in Amsterdam. I'm Emily Freeman. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. How many people have been to um, two sessions in the track? Awesome. Anyone been to all five? Awesome. That's fantastic. You can find me on Twitter at Editing Emily. You've likely heard the news, news of our own major outage late last year. A series of lightning strikes, power failures, escalating heat in our San Antonio data center all contributed to a pretty bad day for many of our customers. And honestly, for us, hug ops all around. We want so badly to believe that these types of things can just be prevented and avoided entirely, but it simply isn't the case. I love this quote. Responding to crises is not idiosyncratic work. It is something that is done all the time. It is this responsiveness that is their source of reliability, which is just a fancy way of saying preparing for incidents is a full-time job, and it goes much further than the reactive response to an outage or incident. Becoming skilled at detecting and solving problems will allow your engineering team to work within your complex systems better. And ensuring you communicate those methodologies throughout the rest of your organization multiplies those benefits. When you teach those around you, you enable them to solve problems without you, which is exactly what you want in the middle of the night and you want to sleep. You don't want to have to get up every single time someone has a question. This communication and culture isn't something we learn in school. And it's not something we know inherently. It's a learned skill, and one your organization would be wise to prioritize. Most of our work is planned, or at least kind of planned. Sure, we throw a couple things in at the end of a sprint, but we have a sprint, right? There are tickets and epics and stories and so on. You have an idea of what kind of work is coming up, even if it's a vague roadmap. But incidents are unplanned work. They're unexpected and they introduce chaos into your system. Not in the cute Netflix way. These aren't cute little monkeys in diapers knocking over surfaces. This is real chaos and angry customers, the kind of chaos that costs money and causes stress. An incident introduces context switching and confusion. That chaotic nature can increase your time to repair. You may have heard of this term, MTTR, it's thrown around a lot by engineers who love to speak only in acronyms. They're sometimes also speaking about AI and ML and usually blockchain. If you don't know what it stands for, it just simply means mean time to recover. Basically, how long from when an outage starts to service being restored. Now remember, MTTR is a time when an incident actually begins to when it's um, resolved. Not necessarily when you first become aware of it. This is an arithmetic mean, remember that from math class, which doesn't account for outliers. It assumes equal distribution, and the outliers will impact that number, sometimes significantly. Every year, the DevOps Research and Assessment Organization, or DORA, puts out an industry report supporting, with data and analysis, supporting the principles and practices introduced with DevOps. It's a fascinating read, and I highly recommend taking a look. I believe the survey is still open if you want to add your perspective to it for this year. 
Time to restore service is always highlighted as a key aspect of software delivery performance. This means that teams who can recover quickly are more elite performers in all areas of software delivery. Other key indicators are deployment frequency, that's how often you deploy code to production, lead time for changes, how long does it take to go from code commit to running successfully in production, change rate failure, what percentage of change results in service disruption, Dora has discovered one other realization I want to highlight, the cost of downtime. You can estimate, and it will be an estimate, the cost by calculating your deployment frequency times your change failure rate times your MTTR times your hourly cost of outage. It's gonna add up. And if you don't know what one or any of those numbers are for your actual organization, don't stress, start there and figure it out. It doesn't need to be a perfect calculation. Instead, you're just looking for a baseline from which you can measure your team's performance and improvement. As you might imagine, the cost of an outage add up quickly. Most of us don't have endless resources to burn. We must respond quickly and effectively, or heads will roll. And those heads don't usually belong to executives. For me, the cost in dollars is less interesting than the cost to brand reputation, customer trust, and team morale. Most of us accept that our systems are complex. And let's be real, they get more complex by the day. Every code base represented in this room has some kind of corner with lots of cobwebs and spaghetti code. The late Jens Rasmussen a system safety and human factors professor in Denmark believed there are three constraints at work in complex systems. Safety, economic, and workload. Our systems are always somewhere within these boundaries. Beyond each boundary lies a particular kind of failure. If you get too close to the safety boundary, you'll experience a safety failure. You can experience unreasonable workloads as you approach that boundary. And you'll navigate over to economic failure if you just keep haphazardly spinning up resources and scaling automatically, as in the last session, without thinking about that bill. Managerial and economic pressure typically push the system's operations closer to the workload and safety boundaries, which inevitably results in failure. And that failure can range from a blip in your monitoring to a spectacular failure, like Knight Capital losing $440 million in 45 minutes. When I say fail fast, that's not what I mean. The truth is that those little blip failures on the screens are happening right now in all of our systems. And no, you didn't just miss a page, <laughs> it's fine. But we do tolerate a certain level of failure every day. It's usually not disastrous, but it's certainly not fine. The first anti-patterns I see when I uncover and work with co um, companies in this type of transformation relate to a learning. Whose email inbox has over 500 emails in it? Okay, some of you are a lot more organized than me. Mine is a disaster. <laughs> it's chaotic, it's life, it adds up. Email is no place for alerts. Certainly not if you've gone so far as to create a rule that automatically archives annoying alerts. My first job as an engineer, um, the engineering team regularly ignored expected alerts. Like, huh? <laughs> Why are we alerting on these things? Alert fatigue is a real thing. Don't do that. Another issue in alerting is a common channel where GIFs and random water cooler dialogue can hide important messages. If you currently work in a place with these types of anti-patterns, you're not alone. We all do things like this, one or more. I'm not here to tell you what you're doing wrong. I'm here to meet you where you're at and to help you incrementally improve. If you're relying on tapping on someone's shoulder to alert them to a problem or searching Twitter for your company's hashtag and down attached to it, we have some work to do. I have another talk called This Is Not Fine, Putting Out Code Fires, 
in which I talk a lot about how FEMA handles incidents. FEMA is the emergency response in the States. We don't need to be as verbose as a government response to a disaster, but we can learn from their decades of experience. One of the concepts we borrow from firefighters and other emergency responders are their processes for creating space, communicating with everyone, alerting those first responders, and bringing more people into the mix as needed. Pulling from standardized emergency response plans, we can begin to establish repeatable and scalable steps to responding to service disruptions in an automated fashion. And this begins with creating the space for engineers to communicate and generate context. When it comes to incidents, chat is the best place for conversations. Teams, Slack, it doesn't really matter where you're at as long as your team's there. Having a written communication vehicle will help everyone be able to reach people in the same place and help new people to the situation come up to speed with what's already happened. Ideally, you'll have a single place where all conversation related to a particular incident can take place. You may already have a designated incident channel, but I would challenge you to go one step further than that and create a separate incident channel for each problem as it arises. There are many benefits of a single incident channel for each event. One is a time-stamped record of the conversations and decisions that took place in real time. This, is, this will help you immensely in your post-incident review, a concept I'll cover later. But I think the real benefit is it's a focused conversation. There's no way to miss an important message or update because of other chatter. You're all there for one purpose. I do think that there's a time and a place for a video call, but there are pros and cons to all forms of communication. If you do choose to call, be sure there's video for the people comfortable being on video in that moment, and try to record the conversation. Conference calls without video can be harder to manage, especially in a chaotic environment where it's difficult to see who's there, who's talking, what they mean. A first responder is simply the first person alerted to a problem. Usually this is the person on call, but it could be someone who just happened to notice something that looked a little wonky. This is where training becomes a differentiator between the companies who handle incidents well and those who don't. First responders should have actionable alerts, as much context as possible, and clear escalation procedures. Remember, no one should hesitate to escalate an incident. When your reputation is on the line, it is much better to overreact than underreact. There are always additional stakeholders internally and externally. You'll need to alert and update throughout the incident. This is where communication really starts to impact your success. I'd recommend utilizing status pages, internal communications, and social media to get your message to the appropriate people. You can't wait for an incident to happen to set up your incident response. That'd be like installing smoke detectors while your house is burning down. It's too late. Instead, you have to set, how, set yourself and your team up for success now. I wanna show you a really simple way you can use Azure Logic Apps to create incident channels in Teams. This demo isn't intended to cover every situation or every use case, but instead to get you thinking about different ways you can use Azure to support your team culture, specifically when it comes to outages, incidents, and recovering and learning from those failures. You can take the core principles of this demo and apply it to your own team. Azure Logic Apps are a logical workflow. You can think of this as just as a step-by-step -step automated way of organizing action. So we're in the portal. I'm in my home screen. Again, yours is going to look a little bit different. And you can pin things to the home for a quick access. We're going to head over to services and look for Logic App. I'm going to find one I pre-populated with two steps. So this is SRE50. 
the basic details. And then I'm just going to simply edit the steps. The first one you're going to see is a unique HTTP request with a URL I'm going to send a curl request to later on in this demo. That is going to expect JSON, which will then be parsed. And this is where we're going to create a Teams channel. So we're going into Microsoft Teams right here. You can search. And there are so many things it integrates with, so you can get really creative. Create a channel. You have to find your team ID. In this case, ours is Microsoft Ignite the Tour. And then we're going to make the channel be named incident dash and then pull that incident number from the JSON. In this case, um, if you're setting this up for you know, real life, it's going to be a little bit different, but the curl is going to highlight how it works. I also want to post a message just initially to give the people new to the channel some information. In this case, you're not going to find an existing channel. You're instead going to pre-populate it with that incident and then the incident number. And then in the message, we simply want to say um, this something's gone wrong. There's another fire. As well as add uh, some extra information. So I'm going to reiterate the incident number. That might feel repetitive, but when it's 3 in the morning and you're blurry-eyed, you can use all the information you can get. You also want to be sure to include severity level, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But this will give people um, more information on whether this is a full-scale outage, if it's impacting customers, or if this is something that maybe can wait till the morning. I also like to include the person on call. That would be a good point of contact. And then there's this more option, so just a little extra info. You can play with all of this and get super creative. All right, so we're just going to save that. It's completed. And then I'm going to hop right over. Well, one of my favorite things about Azure is you can actually look under the hood and see what's happening um, and get a better idea of how it's actually working. So you can look at the code right there that it generates, which I love, and then you run it. To demonstrate this works, I'm going to head over to the terminal. Just a curl request to that URL you saw in the first step. And we'll just confirm that it worked. So heading over to Teams, we've got this new incident channel, 3470. And then if you look at the JSON I sent over, it was 3470. So pretty simple, but a clever workaround and a way you can um, start to use Azure to support your DevOps and SRE culture. If you want more information on Logic Apps, our docs are phenomenal. You can find more information at aka.ms forward slash SRE50 logic. And then alerting under the same pattern except dash alert. Generally, there are five types of incidents. The lower three are much less severe, three, four, and five. But the two above, SEV1 and SEV2 require a coordinated response. These are full, complete outages, the whole site's down, or a major functionality is impacted. So that could be your cart or signups. The full life cycle of an incident can be broken down into five smaller categories, stages through which your team will pass during every incident. Thinking about it like this allows us to isolate and target specific areas of improvement. That way, we're enabling our teams to make data-driven decisions and improve each of these phases incrementally. Unfortunately, we normally think about the first three phases the most, detection, response, and remediation. I'm going to cover these sections first, but I want you to remember that the last two are perhaps the most important. Not the most, most urgent, but the most important. Because while the first three phases will get your service up and running again, 
The last two will prevent the same failure in the future. Dividing up the phases of the life cycle helps you to understand and analyze each. Figuring out something is wrong is the first step. That detection phase will be the first place you go during an incident. Knowing about a problem is that initial step. And when it comes to maintaining service availability, being aware of the problems quickly is essential. Monitoring, actionable alerting, and on-call processes are the biggest tools you have in this phase. Once a problem is known, an incident's life cycle is the response phase. You'll spend about a third of your time in this phase. You and your team will investigate, identify, triage, escalate, communicate, and test those hypotheses as you mitigate the issue. Ideally, you'll quickly identify what's happening and figure out next steps. The first responder is typically the person on call, but it could be someone who just saw something. This person should be a part of a reasonable and humane on-call rotation where everyone on your engineering team shares the burden of being on call. This person should have access to systems and observability toolings, tools, as well as the escalation paths and communication channels. The IC, or incident commander, is a role during any coordinated response with your whole team. This person may not be the most senior person on your team, but for this incident, they are the person in charge. They are the source of truth for what is happening, who's involved, and what's next. They are in command of the situation and work with technical subject matter experts as well as communications folks to ensure a smooth process, or as smooth as we can make it. Ideally, this person will be able to enable the entire response team to capture information, communicate with each other, and collaborate to find a solution. Sometimes during a chaotic outage, you must contact the subject matter experts on your team to help triage the situation. Diverse experience and perspectives are important, including those who have knowledge relevant to the restoration of services or those impacted. Don't hesitate to bring those engineers into the response effort. Subject matter experts, or SMEs, are typically your senior or principal engineers. Their broader mental models and awareness of architecture and code dependencies across the system, as well as deep technical knowledge, will help you identify the appropriate response more quickly. Some teams call the comm chief a scribe or a historian. This person will document what's happening during an outage. And they'll pay close att attention to context and information not actively shared in that chat channel, including if you hop to video. It's a good idea to have them sort of jot notes for what's happening. This record should never be used as a mechanism for blame. Instead, it should create the foundation from which you'll evaluate your processes in your post-incident review. Often, figuring out what's causing the issue takes the most time, and finding a fix, even if it's as simple or as temporary as rolling back a deploy, will often take the least amount of time. At this point, the communications chief and IC should work on notifying the necessary stakeholders and customers that a fix is on the way. Be sure to under-promise and over-deliver on your timelines. Leave that room for unexpected snafus. Chat ops is another tool that can help increase your collaboration as well as enable more visibility and awareness as you learn what went wrong and what needs fixing. Chat ops tools proactively provide helpful information into an incident channel. This includes charts or query results that may assist in the response and remediation phases of an incident. Chat ops tools can push context, retrieve data, interact bi-directionally, and customize infrastructure interactions. Anything is possible. It all depends on how fancy and creative you want to take it, how much customization you're up for. This includes communicating with third-party services, such as incident management and on-call tools, as well as triggering scripts, executing multi-step automation. This could include deploying code, restarting services, or engaging in DDoS protocols. 
We have a Microsoft Learn module specifically for chat ops. If you want to go check that out, it's a great resource. There is no single root cause of a failure in a complex system. We used to have this term, root cause analysis, but we've moved away from that. Instead, we recognize that it's a series of errors due to an ever-changing state that we live in. And stopping change really isn't an option, right? We have to continue to grow and evolve and produce great software. The good news is that shifting our conversations away from causality provides a clearer picture of our systems. We don't want to focus on some silver bullet. Instead, we want to look at the condi conditions that allowed that situation to manifest. This will provide valuable information into the nature of your socio-technical systems. If you don't have that root cause analysis, well, what do you do? I want you to replace this need to hunt for a single reason of failure with what's called a post-incident review. Simply put, it's an opportunity to review, discuss, and learn from failure as a team. The purpose is less to produce artifacts and more to discuss what happened as an engineering team. Depending on your leadership, they may not love this. A lot of times executives want a one sentence issue and what happened, but that's not how it works. And we need to push back on that train of thought. Some companies actually choose to publish summaries of the post-incident reviews or even live stream it. I don't know about you, I don't think I'm ready for that type of public honesty. But being honest and forthcoming as a team will galvanize you in ways I can't begin to describe. Our goal should always be to maximize opportunities for organizational learning, because we want to collectively discover improvements and understand more about the system as a whole. Post-incident reviews are an opportunity to gather everyone together from a variety of experiences and backgrounds and perspectives and review your current processes around incidents, as well as corrective actions that may be necessary to prevent a similar incident in the future. Without a formalized way to share information and reflect, a lot of useful information about the system in its entirety will never be discussed or explored. Knowledge won't be transferred, learning opportunities will be wasted, and systems will continue to break in new and old ways. The last thing you want is for your response and remediation efforts to be reactionary and chaotic. Encourage discussion and perspective on the challenges you face. You want to dig more into the complexity, dynamics, attrition, nuance that make up your system as a whole. Schedule the post-incident review as soon as possible after an incident. I suggest waiting no more than 36 hours. Yes, take the rest you need to recover, sleep, but don't wait so long that you lose the fresh context and memories of your experience during the outage. The venue for your post-incident review doesn't matter, so long as the environment is welcoming to discussion by many diverse voices, free of blame, shame, or anything threatening psychological safety of the people involved. If you're not sure who you should invite, invite everyone. I'm serious. The base folks that you want to be sure are at your post-incident review are the primary person on call, any of the first responders, secondary people on call, if required, incident commander, communications chief, and anyone else who is interested in attending. I would open it up to the entire company because I can't think of a better way to help them understand the stresses that we experience as an engineering team. Just remind everyone in the room that post-incident reviews are blameless, and it is never a hunt for who is at fault. Involving stakeholders from other areas of the business will bring fresh perspective. You want to understand what happened from the perspective of the individuals involved and those who observed. The more diverse points of view you can collect, the fuller the picture of the incident will be. Encourage and note dissenting opinions. Often those provide the most interesting feedback. Between chat logs and the communication chief's notes, you should have fairly good timeline of what happened and when. 
But something that's really important to remember is incidents aren't linear, and neither is the response. Multiple individuals work in parallel to restore services. Each engineer working on a various phase of the incident response will arrive at a different context and experience. They will have different skills, different levels of rest, and different confidence in their ability to mediate the issue. Be sure to note any Im high impact tasks. So that's people, or things you did that influenced it positively, as well as negative impact ta tasks and work you did that had no impact at all. You also want to make a note of the conversations, dissonance, disagreements. Ask the question, what context was this engineer working within when they made the decision? There's this discretionary space where the human responders can decide to act or not. Whatever judgment you conclude on those decisions will be made completely in hindsight, with hindsight bias. This is often more relevant and insightful than other data points. Accountability means gaining an accurate account of what took place. It is not an insinuation of responsibility for negative outcomes. Avoiding blame and punishment is the only way to gather a full account of what happened. If we punish an engineer for their role, everyone is disincentivized to provide the necessary details to get an understanding of what took place, which all but guarantees that the failure will occur again. When engineers feel safe to give details about what they knew, what they did, they're not only willing to be held accountable, they're also enthusiastic in helping the rest of the company learn and improve. This is what creates a learning organization. Be sure to reserve enough time for discussing and deciding which countermeasures to implement. Ensure those countermeasures are recorded with a target date and an owner for follow-up. Potential countermeasures from a post-incident review could include automated tests for your de deployment pipeline, additional telemetry for blind spots, game day exercises where you practice failure, and changes in your on-call process. Some companies choose to publish incident summaries. Some information is unnecessary or too sensitive to share with the public. But you do want to be as thorough and informative as possible while remaining concise and factual with recognition, remorse, and a remedy as it relates to the impact on users. If you do choose to publish a summary, I would include the services impacted, the duration of the impact, the severity, which customers in particular, or the level of customer impact, resolution, countermeasures, and improvements your team is actively working on or has already completed. Finally, prepare for the future. The aim isn't to avoid problems, but rather to be well prepared, informed, and ready to deal with incidents when they arise. Create countermeasures to add into your planned work to better prepare. This could include on-call rotations, escalation paths, communication channels, response training, chaos engineering, testing, and production. If you're more interested in this talk in particular, you can download some of the resources we've made available to you from the whole learning path and share your findings on Twitter. Thank you for joining us.